What can miserable Christians sing? Asks Carl Truman in his well-known essay. And in it, Truman recognizes that life has a sad, melancholy, and painful dimension, which is too often undermined and sometimes even ignored in our churches. Nevertheless, God has given the church a language which allows it to express even the deepest agonies of the human soul in the context of worship, close quote. I think Dr. Truman has a point. No matter what seasons of life, the ups and downs, the joys and sorrows, in triumphant symphonies or melancholic laments, Christianity is a faith that sings. But if we're honest, there are many weeks when singing is hard, when we walk into church with heavy hearts, stressed, tired, overwhelmed, feeling underappreciated, worried, and anxious. How about you? Can you relate? How do you sing when you're burdened with life, when you're weighed down by sin, or bothered by broken relationships, saddened by disappointments, frustrated with unmet desires and unanswered prayers and closed doors? When it seems like you are in a perpetual holding pattern waiting for something to change, do you look around and wonder how others have it all together? Do you pretend to put your best foot forward and smile your way through your season of discontentment? How do you find joy in such seasons like these? Well, brothers and sisters, take courage. I want to remind you that this is a congregation of broken and needy sinners just like you, just like me. And I have good news for you. Our passage this morning speaks to us and reminds us of the reasons why we sing, the reasons why we can rejoice even in the midst of great despair. In our text this morning, we see a group of people, although in dire despondency, singing a hopeful song, singing a joyful song. But how? How can miserable Christians sing such songs of thanksgiving, joy, and praise throughout the generations, through suffering, through hardship, even through judgment? Our passage tells us how. So wherever you are, however you came, be reminded this morning from Isaiah chapter 12 of the joys we have in God in the midst of trials. Here's the outline so you can follow, if you are the note-taking type, three points. Point number one, the joy of salvation from verses one through two. Point number two, the joy of worship from verses three and four. And the joy of evangelism from verse five and six. Salvation, worship, and evangelism. I pray that these reminders of God's grace and provision will encourage you to be strengthened in hope and trust in our Lord Jesus Christ. And I pray that you would find refreshment in the joys presented in our passage today. Guests and visitors, welcome. If you are here and you do not know yourself to be a Christian, we especially welcome you today. If you're here, uh, praise God that the Lord has led you here. We've been praying that God would lead you here to hear his life-changing good news of Jesus Christ. In him, you can be forgiven of your sins. In him, you can be reconciled to God. In him, you can be restored to a right relationship with him and his people. And you can receive the gift of new and eternal life if you would repent and trust in him. So without further ado, let's turn now to his word, to Isaiah chapter 12. And as you turn there, I want to encourage you to please keep your Bibles open and reference it often for the entire duration as I read and preach so that you know that this is God's word for you to grow you in knowledge, love, and trust in him. As you find your way, uh, let me give you some context. The book of Isaiah is one of the most important books of the Old Testament. It's quoted or referred to in the New Testament more than 200 times. Written around 740 to 680 BC, Isaiah is a book of prophecy in which God speaks through the chosen prophet named Isaiah, whose name unironically means God saves to bring a message of judgment. You see, in Isaiah's day, the people of God had turned a deaf ear to God's word. Instead of serving and trusting the one true God, they offered up meaningless sacrifices and committed injustices to their neighbors. They turned to trust 
uh, other kings and other gods and even in themselves, which was the reason why Isaiah pronounced God's great judgment and their impending ruin. But as Isaiah declares God's righteous punishments against Israel's sins and against the surrounding nations, we get a sense throughout the pages of Isaiah that God's warnings and judgments have a deeper and greater purpose, a promise of ultimate salvation. Although Israel's situation seemed dark and hopeless, Isaiah's prophecies offered a clear message of hope. It was God's way of calling his people back to himself, displaying his power and glory to Israel and the world, proving once again that there is no other God beside Yahweh through both their destruction and redemption. It was God's way to demonstrate his loving kindness and faithfulness to a remnant, showing that he is the covenant-keeping God through the promised Messiah, Jesus Christ, who would usher in a new exodus. And this promised salvation is made most prominent in our chapter today, in Isaiah chapter 12. Here in Isaiah chapter 12, in the shortest chapter of the entire book, the climax of the first major part of Israel, uh, Isaiah. And this high point is a right occasion and celebration, a song of praise to God. It's a concise yet powerful promise of God's clearest intention to save his people through and from judgment by his Messiah. I know we read the passage, but let's read it again. Isaiah chapter 12, verse 1 through 6 says this. You will say in that day, I will give thanks to you, O Lord, for though you were angry with me, your anger turned away, that you might comfort me. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and will not be afraid. For the Lord God is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation, and you will say in that day, give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the nation, among the peoples. Proclaim that his name is exalted. Sing praises to the Lord, for he has done gloriously. Let this be made known in all the earth. Shout and sing for joy, O inhabitant of Zion, for great in your midst is the Holy One of Israel. So what can miserable Christians sing? Point number one, we can sing of the joy of salvation. Look with me to verse 1 again. It says, You will say in that day, I will give thanks to you, O Lord, for though you were angry with me, your anger turned away, that you might comfort me. The first observation we can make from verse 1 is the fact that Isaiah is predicting what God's rebellious people will one day declare in the future. You will say. They're singing a song of thanksgiving, but they haven't sung it yet. They will praise the true God, but they were turning to false gods. Remember, God's people Israel had become those who did not understand, who did not perceive. They were wise in their own eyes. They were shrewd in their own sight. But God knew their true condition, didn't he? He said of them in Isaiah chapter 1, verse 8, their whole head is sick and the whole heart faint, From sole of the foot even to the head, there is no soundness in it. They were utterly, thoroughly, and miserably depraved. Well, what happens that their haughtiness and lofty pride and wicked hearts become humbled and changed? The phrase, in that day, makes all the difference. It's a phrase that Isaiah repeated throughout his prophecies, referring to the day when all that God declares will come to light and to fruition. Although some regard this day to a particular day in history when God would deliver Israel from the Assyrian invasion, it is impossible to read Isaiah 12 without seeing that in this day refers to a later day, a future day of the Messiah, the day of the anointed promised king that God himself would send. Verses like uh, Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14 gives us a clue who this promised king would be. It says this, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. 
Passages like chapter 9, verse 6 and 7. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. You see, this anointed king, this highly exalted king would be the reason why the cursed lips of wicked men will turn to thankfulness and praise. But there's more amazingness in this verse, and we're still uh, in verse 1. <laughs> Isaiah foreshadows something unimaginable to happen. And the previous chapters shows us why. In Isaiah chapter 5, verse 25, it says this, The anger of the Lord was kindled against his people, and he stretched out his hand against them and struck them. But it says, For all this, his anger has not turned away. In chapter 9, verse 11 and 12, the Lord raises the adversaries and stirs up his enemies and devours Israel with open mouth. But it says, for all this, his anger has not turned away. In chapter 9, verse 17, when the people still do not turn to him, the Lord cut off from Israel head and tail, for everyone is godless and an evildoer. But it says, for all this, his anger has not turned away. In chapter 9, verse 21, through the wrath of the Lord of hosts, the land is scorched, and the people are like fuel for the fire. No one spares another. Yet, for all this, his anger has not turned away. In chapter 10, verse 4, God asks, What will you do on the day of punishment, in the ruin that will come from afar? To whom will you flee for help? Nothing remains but to crouch among the prisoners or fall among the slain. Even then, when nothing is left but destruction and ruin, it says, for all this, his anger has not turned away. You see, God's anger against Israel and against wicked humanity is not pacified through destruction, not through judgment. But don't misunderstand. It's clear in Ezekiel 33, 1, God says, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked would turn from a turn from his way and live. And God pleads, turn back. Turn back from your evil ways. For why will you die, O house of Israel? So then, what happens that is so incredibly fate-altering that makes even the most depraved and wicked people, those who rejected their own God, even after such great deliverances and provisions, out of the bondage of Egypt, through the Red Sea, through the desert, through the promised land, to King David's reign, to Solomon's glorious temple being built, to a kingdom divided and at the cusp of exile, yet still rejecting, still rebelling, still disobeying. How were their hearts turned from looking to the earth to looking up to God in praise? The following words of this passage are probably the most glorious, extraordinary, comforting words in all of the Old Testament. For though you were angry with me, your anger turned away. Brothers and sisters, because God is a holy and righteous God, he cannot tolerate sin. He must punish sin or else he would not be a good God. Well, some of you may ask, what crime was committed that was so bad that makes God so angry that he would destroy the world and send people to hell? That seems a bit crazy. That seems a bit unfair. Well, let me illustrate. If a man has a bad day and decides to take his frustration out on a random man walking by and gives him a good hard shove, you would call him a jerk. If a man has a bad day and decides to take his frustra frustration out on a little child and hits a baby, that man needs to be taken to the police and sent per perhaps to an insane asylum. If a man has a bad day and decides to punch a president, he'd be taken to federal prison as a terrorist. But if a man sins against a per perfectly righteous, holy God who is perfectly loving and good, over and over and over again, deliberately disobeying his word, mocking him with his pride and self-centeredness. That is a punishment deserving of eternal hell, eternal judgment, is it not? The punishment of our crime escalates by whom the crime is committed against. 
It is only fair that our right sentence is eternal hell against an eternal God. That is why the phrase, though you were angry with me, your anger turned away, are such beautiful, incredible, merciful words for you and me. You see, the fundamental problem of the sinner is the wrath of a righteous God against sin. Romans 1.18 says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. Only by the death of God's own Son, as our substitute sacrifice, His punishment could be satiated. Isaiah 53 gives us a fuller and clearer picture of how God Himself would send the Messiah, which says this, Surely He has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was a chastisement that brought us peace. And by his wounds we are healed. All like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Brothers and sisters, friends and visitors, this is the good news of Jesus Christ. This is the best news you will ever hear, that God, who is holy and just, created us in love for his own glory and for our pleasure. But man, having been tempted by Satan, chose to trust in himself, wanting to be a God for himself, deliberately disobeying God's word. As a result, you know that man was separated from God completely helpless and incapable of saving himself from the vain and dissatisfying power and curse of sin. Men turn to other gods, but there's no help there, no escape, no cure, no satisfaction from the curse. But God had a plan from the very beginning to redeem man from our miserable and meaningless rebellion and forgive man for their sins. How? By sending his own son, Jesus Christ, who is truly God and truly man, to live the life that we could not live, to die the death that we should have died. He took our place as a substitute on the cross. He paid the debt that we would have paid in eternal hell. And in that day, the anger of the Lord turned from us to his son. Jesus took the full wrath of God upon himself as he turned to the Father and pled, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And he willingly gave up his spirit, declaring, it is finished. Then on the third day, Jesus Christ rose again from death, which meant that God accepted his sacrifice once and for all, which meant that Jesus conquered sin, Satan, and death. So now, whosoever would look to him in trust will not die and go to hell, but participate in his resurrection and live the new and abundant life here on earth and eternal life with him forevermore. Hallelujah. This is the comfort of God, brothers and sisters. For though you were angry with me, your anger turned away that you might comfort me. This is the blessed assurance. This is everlasting hope and peace with God. My salvation is not dependent on me, but entirely on him. That's why Isaiah testifies on behalf of all who trust in God in verse 2. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and will not be afraid. For the Lord God is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. You see, I had no strength to call my own, no willpower, no fitness, no intellect to grasp the mystery of salvation, no way to save myself. I had no joy to sing, no life, no peace, no hope until he has become my salvation. I had no testimony. I had no salvation. But now, God is my salvation because he has become my salvation. Hallelujah. I will trust and will not be afraid. Remember, these were words of prophecy. It hasn't occurred yet. This was 700 years before Jesus was even born on earth. That's why God through Isaiah declared words like from Isaiah chapter 43, verse 10. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. 
Brothers and sisters, as the Israelites look forward to the Messiah's coming in God's word, we can look back at Christ's first coming in his word and we could trust in his word because every word that God has promised has been kept in Jesus, the Messiah, our Savior and Lord. Amen? Amen? amen. amen. If you say amen and respond back to me, you'll be warmer. <laughs> amen? In the Hebrew, the original language that Isaiah was written, the you in verse 1 is singular grammatically. You will say in that day. Dear beloved brothers and sisters in Christ, is this your personal testimony? God is my salvation. I will trust and will not be afraid. The Lord God is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. Then you have a reason to rejoice this morning. No matter what seasons of life, no matter what trial or circumstances come your way, you have a reason to rejoice today. If you're here this morning and you are not a Christian or you are not sure that you are, there's no better place for you to be on Sunday morning than with God's people under God's word. We believe that God is sovereign and that's why we know that you are not here by coincidence, by mistake, by chance at all. So since you are here, let me ask you a question. If you're not a Christian, do you have peace with God? Perhaps you felt the weight of his anger in the way you lack joy, in the way you feel empty, in the way you have no ultimate hope. People have disappointed you. You have disappointed yourself. You have no security, no firm ground to stand on, no firm foundation. Well, if Jesus isn't your substitute, your advocate, your Savior and Lord, the Bible says very clearly, you will not stand in the judgment. The guilty will be punished. You will incur the full wrath of judgment you have reaped upon yourself against God because you have rejected his mercy by rejecting his son. So I plead with you, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ who made an end to all your sins, sins of the past, present, and future. This morning, you are either forgiven or you are not. You are either clear in God's sight or else the wrath of God abides on you. And I beg of you, do not rest until you know where you stand. Do not hesitate. Friend, repent of your sins today. Believe that Jesus died and rose again for you. Trust in Jesus as your Savior this moment, this morning. If you want to know more about following Jesus, please feel free to talk to me or Pastor Matt or any of the elders of this church at the end of service or somebody smiling next to you. We'd be happy to share with you how awesome and amazing and exciting it is to follow Jesus Christ, the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ of River City Baptist Church, in your trials, in your waiting, is there perhaps any of you who have forgotten the joy of your salvation? The psalmist prayed, restore unto me the joy of your salvation. Psalm 42, 11 says, why are you downcast, O my soul? Why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. So this morning, dear brothers and sisters, be reminded of the joy of your salvation. Point number two, what can weary Christians sing? Point number two, we can sing of the joy of of worship. Look at verse 3. It says this. With joy, you will draw water from the wells of salvation. This verse is a beautiful picture of how through God's merciful salvation, we who are dirty are cleansed by God from our sin. And how we who are parched, empty, and calloused are now satisfied by his thirst-quenching drink from his wells of salvation. To describe to you a more vivid picture of this verse, one commentator describes it this way. A person who casually turns on the faucet or tap water in an air-conditioned kitchen has little sense of the impact of these words of Isaiah on the Jews of his day. But Isaiah was writing directly to men and women who walked long under the mid-eastern sun, reflected from the hot sands, and then reveled at the cool water drawn immediately from a well. As they read Isaiah's words, they could feel the cool refreshment of water moistening their lips and parched throats and splashing on their dusty feet. The illustration of the phrase, wells of salvation, shows us two ways in which God continues to sufficiently and 
uh, sufficiently supply us even after salvation. So here's first. Here's the first. God is the source of life. There are several examples of this in Scripture where water is God's provision as the source of life. Here's one example, Isaiah 55, verse 1. Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and he who has no money, come, buy, and eat. As men come to God thirsty, God will make water flow on barren mountains. He will cause springs to burst forth from parched ground. God will urge men to drink this water. And remember what Jesus says in John chapter 7, verse 37? Jesus quoting Isaiah 55, 1 and referring to Isaiah 12 says, If anyone thirst, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Jesus says, come and drink of me. Secondly, God is the source of growth and refreshment or sanctification. I love the relational aspect that verse 3 draws out for us. We continually draw, and he constantly provides. You see, this relational aspect of drawing from the wells of salvation is not only in the sense of vertical relationship, me and God, but it's also horizontal. Whereas in verse 1, the original Hebrew word for you will say is singular, showing us that to enter salvation is an individual experience, but we get to enjoy the benefits of his salvation as a community. The Hebrew word here for you in verse 3, with joy you will draw, is now in the plural form. With joy, you all, y'all, I'm from Texas, I grew up from te in Texas, <laughs> y'all is an okay word to use, y'all will draw water from the wells of salvation. Isn't that amazing? One commentator notes it this way, the tiny beginnings of one man's salvation has grown into the company of the redeemed. One man's song modulates into a singing community. And the Holy One, who was the sinner's greatest threat, now dwells in the midst of an exultant city as the life-giving and lifetime supply of well-being. Close quote. Like so, this church, River City Baptist Church, is a community of individuals that God has knit together, isn't it? To reap the blessing of God's salvation together. And for the members of this church body to bless and to benefit, and to build up one another. Amen? The summer of 2015 uh, was a particularly difficult season for my family. Various things happened that summer to make the situation very difficult. But namely, we had found out my wife, Jerry, had miscarried, had missed financial burdens, no insurance during a significant ministry transition. Joblessness and homelessness and uncertainty about the future was what marked our, that season. Uh, in those days, I didn't even have words to say, much less words to sing. And there wasn't much sleeping in those days. All I could do was get on my face with my Bible open, praying, Lord, help me. Have mercy on me. Search me. Have I sinned? Have I disobeyed? All sorts of depressing and discouraging thoughts were a constant battle. But on one of those Sundays, we were at church, happening, happened to sit up very close, singing a song called, song called, Oh, the Deep, Deep Love of Jesus. I noticed my wife crying next to me while singing, and it stirred my heart to sing the words of the hymn to her as well. Oh, the deep, deep love of Jesus, vast, unmeasured, boundless, free, rolling as a mighty ocean in its fullness over me, underneath me. All around me is the current of thy love, leading onward, leading homeward to thy glorious rest above. Being encouraged by the singing, we happened to catch a glimpse of our pastor at the time, Pastor Mark Dever, looking at Jerry and knowing our situation, he was crying too as he was singing. We were singing, we were praising, praying, and encouraging, singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs to one another, one miserable soul to another miserable soul, one weary heart to another weary heart, hoping, trusting, ever, and pointing one another to our source and supply of life, our Lord Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, a local church is a well of salvation 
for our dry and parched souls, a dear refuge for our weary souls. Amen? Well, nearly nine years later, the Lord has gifted us with two more children, very rowdy, energetic boys. And all by his grace, God has given me the privilege of pastoring a healthy, growing church in Rockville, Maryland, which we planted four and a half years ago in the heart of, during the heart of COVID. It took five and a half long years of waiting and more waiting and disappointments, getting humbled, growing for God's right time for me to pastor a church. And so now, remembering his abundant grace, we sing these jo- uh, songs every Sunday with greater faith. We know better now, more deeply, more truly, the joy of singing these songs to one another together. I can't believe it. Every Sunday, why people show up to our church, to my church. Uh, How through this season of transition in our church, we have met in the past year, less than a year, 12 different locations. It's really hard to find a place to worship at in Montgomery County. And still, new visitors continue to show up. I know it's only by the grace of God. Only by the power of God, the Spirit of God, we gather each Sunday to sing, pray, read, hear, and see the Word of God proclaimed and displayed for His glory. Amen? With joy, you all will draw water from the wells of salvation together. The psalmist testifies in Psalm 30, verses 11 and 12, you have turned for me my mourning into dancing, You have loosened my sackcloth and clothed me with gladness that my glory may sing your praise and not be silent. O Lord my God, I will give thanks to you forever. Brothers and sisters, isn't it such a joy to be a member of this local church, to lean on each other through hardship and sorrows in good times and bad? Are you thankful for the well that is River City Baptist Church? Look at the ways that he has blessed you and grown you in these thirty year, uh, three years. Keep going. Keep trusting. Keep singing. Beloved members of RCBC, how often do you joyfully draw from the wells of salvation? You notice it says wells of salvation. It doesn't mean that there are many ways or paths to salvation. There's only one way, but many wells of salvation to encourage and refresh us along the way. If you're not a Christian, What do you do when the wells of this life runs dry? When you exhaust all your resources, all your emotional, physical capital? Does any earthly thing give you deep, lasting satisfaction? Money, sex, pornography, alcohol, drugs, any of that? You see, those things are not meant to fill you up or to satisfy you. It can't. It's not supposed to. That's why the more you have it, the more you want it to your growing discontentment. Jesus says in John 4.13, whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. So brothers and sisters in Christ, have you lost the joy to sing or are you in a place where joy seems distant? We often forget that the joy of corporate worship was designed to guard us against apathy and complacency. God calls us into community, unity, and building up. So brothers and sisters, draw and drink from the source and supplier of life. Draw and drink from the source of life, Jesus, and you will find rest for your souls. Draw and drink from his unending supply. And if you're not a Christian, continue to come week after week after week and get to know these people and draw together from this well of salvation until Jesus returns. That's point number two. Point number three, much shorter point. What can restless Christians sing? We can sing the joy of evangelism from the last two verses, four through six. We know that evangelism is the natural overflow of our salvation and worship, isn't it? Every single one of us who became Christian are are the result of someone bringing the evangel, the good news, to us. So the challenge for us is who will you lead to Jesus? It won't happen if you don't share, if you don't speak, if you don't proclaim the joy of your salvation and the joy of worship. Well, what should we be proclaiming? First, we should proclaim his works 
among the peoples. Look at verses four and five. It says this. Give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Proclaim that his name is exalted. Sing praises to the Lord, for he has done gloriously. Let this be made known in all the earth. Our task is to make known and proclaim Jesus' finished work on the cross, his death and resurrection, and redemption of peoples from every nation, tribe, people, and language, so that praises to the Lord can be lifted up among all peoples. We should make known that this has been God's eternal plan of redemption from the very beginning all along. Secondly, we should proclaim the greatness of Christ in our midst. Look at verse 6. Shout and sing for joy, O inhabitant of Zion, for great in your midst is the Holy One of Israel. Remember, Isaiah 12 is a prophecy. But for us living in post-Christian uh, Christ's first coming, we have a full perspective and insight of, it in his, of his salvific work. Our lives are completely transformed in the revelation that God is with us, that he is Emmanuel God. The old things have passed away and the new things have come. This is our witness of him. In fact, the reason why we exist today on earth as Christians is to proclaim the good news, the best news to everyone, to the world. Finally, we get to proclaim his return. Did you notice how our proclamation intensifies in verse 6? Look at that verse again. Shout and sing for joy, O inhabitant of Zion, for great in your midst is the Holy One of Israel. The reason is because our great Lord, the Holy One of Israel, in our midst is coming back again to sovereignly rule and reign over the new heavens and the new earth. I love that the word inhabitant of Zion in the original Hebrew is once again referred in the singular, this time in the feminine form. As the church, the body of Christ, look forward to Christ, the bridegroom. We have hope. We have great joy because Jesus is coming again. Amen? This is the joy of our proclamation and witness. Jesus is coming again. This is the reason why the church can always look above and forward. Jesus is coming again. In that day, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. In that day, faith will turn to sight. In that day, when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. In that day, all of our suffering, all of our enduring, all of our waiting, all of our persecution will be justified and fully satisfied at his return. Brothers and sisters, Isaiah 12 is a song we will sing in future glory, but it is also a song that we can sing of today. What a day it will be. What a joy we have to sing today and every day when all of our sorrows will be turned to laughter and joy and shouting his praises. Isaiah 25, 8 says of that day, he will swallow up death forever and the Lord will wipe away tears from all faces and the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth. It will be a day of great rejoicing because the Holy One of Israel will be in our midst forever. What can miserable, weary, Restless Christians sing today. We can sing of the joy of salvation. We can sing of the joy of worship. We can sing of the joy of evangelism. It's so easy for us to forget these basic gifts from God, isn't it? I want to encourage you and, and tell you, remind you that God knows how hard it is. He knows you're waiting. But until that day, let us continue. Let us keep drinking deep from the wells of salvation and remember the joys we have in him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the truth, the certainty, and the guarantee of the promise of your word. Father, we know that the grass withers and flowers fade, but your word will stand forever. Thank you for the privilege that we know and believe in the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, the certainty of his finished work on the cross and his resurrection that gives us joy and hope and new and eternal life, which will sustain us and keep us to the end.
Father, thank you that even in the midst of suffering, we as your people have a reason to sing. Father, we pray that you would grant River City Baptist Church to sing Sunday after Sunday with much faith, love, and hope, with great joy for many generations to come until our dying breath or until you return. Bless and persevere this church to be a shining light in this city. Draw many to know you through the ministry of this church for your glory and the good of your people. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.